I'll start with the uh, with the budget. The governor has uh, just go over it again. When we first get into Montpelier in January, when we first get into Montpelier in January, we're in the middle of a fiscal year. We're in fiscal uh, 2019 right now, and the first thing we do is the budget adjustment act. Last month, I explained that that was what the appropriations committee was doing, and the budget adjustment act, as the name implies, it's, it's an adjustment. It's a true up. Uh, the budget is based on, on projections. They're not predictions. They're not magic. It's taking the information available and, and making the best, most reasonable estimates of what revenues are going to be and what expenses are going to be. And then halfway through the fiscal year, you, you, uh, you true it up. You, uh, you try to find money if you haven't taken it and what you thought you'd take. If there's something was more expensive, then you try to find uh, a way to, to pay for it. If something was less expensive, then you try to figure out what to do with that money. Um, and uh, we are done with that. The fiscal, the, the, the Budget Adjustment Act for this year was actually rather uninteresting in that um, the, the um, estimates were not as far off as in, in other years. And uh, again, some people say, well, why don't you get it right the first time? And it's more or less like when you're driving in, you, know, you, you make adjustments. It's, it's, it's responding to things being what they are instead of what we thought they'd be. Um, so now we're on the budget. You learned in high school that the legislature legislates and tells the executive what to do. The executive branch then does what the legislature tells them to do. The other wrinkle on that, though, is that the executive branch tells the legislature what it is they think we should tell them. And uh, it's not binding. We don't have to do it. But uh, that's a template. That's really what we work from. Under the Vermont Constitution, all spending bills and all revenue raising bills have to originate in the People's House, in the House of Representatives. Uh, but they re really, the budget originates on the fifth floor in the governor's office. Or at least the template, the recommended. Many of my colleagues mistakenly refer to the governor's recommend as, quote, the budget, which it actually isn't. The budget is written by the legislature. We don't have a budget yet. But um, we work from the governor's uh, uh, recommend. Uh, this year, uh, Governor Scott has, has recommended a budget of $6.1 billion, with a B, dollars. Uh, Vermonters can't believe that the little state of Vermont spends that much. But that's what, what, what the budget is. Uh, it's a small uh, increase over over last year, and um, I don't know. It's uh, it is in the House that the bill is being developed in the House Appropriations Committee, but um, the Senate uh, doesn't just wait for the bill. We um, we take testimony in anticipation of, of getting the, uh, the budget. The entire Appropriations Committee is responsible for the entire budget, but then also we break the budget up into segments, and each individual member of the committee researches the, those particular parts of the, uh, of the, of the budget. Um, I, I do um, a, a variety. I do uh, e uh, economic promotion, uh, which is part of it. Uh, I do labor. I do uh, the tax department. Uh, and it's uh, a lot of people go away during town meeting. Uh, we, we, since we're taking, since we're not in Montpelier on town meeting day, we we take the rest of the week off without pay. I might mention every year, I get angry emails about us giving ourselves a, a paid vacation. We actually don't. Uh, and and many of, uh, of my colleagues last year, I went to Florida for a week. Um, this year, I am spending. The rest of town meeting week in Montpelier because I really want to catch up on the budget and uh, the interviewing um, uh, uh, bureaucrats who think they're they're rid of us for a week, but they're in the ones who I'm responsible for. They're not rid of me. Um, the other projects that I'm in, involved on in the morning I serve on health and welfare. Uh, we had a, a bill to expand uh, health care for we we'll provide health care subsidies to. To poor people, uh, to expand that to dental. Uh, it's a new senator who has offered it. I asked her, okay, um, how do you propose we pay for it? And she 
she kind of scolded me for asking them, that we should just decide it's the right thing to do and find the money somewhere. I said, well, actually, you're the sponsor of the bill. You're supposed to find the money, too. And, uh, Do they have an idea how much that is? Uh, we're looking into it. This is a, is a, is a way. But you know that with, with so many of these expenses, uh, and, and it's frustrating, is, is that probably if you spend the money, you'll save money down the road. And, and probably helping people with their, with their dental will save money down the road. But not this year. You gotta find the money that you spend it now. You gotta find now. So um, it's often been said that that in terms of, of the, the, the state helping people with health care, um, we ignore everything above the, the neck. We don't do dental. We don't do eyeglasses. We don't do a lot of uh, mental health. I mean, we do mental health urgency. People who have to be who are really in trouble, but just ongoing mental health. We don't do a lot of help with that. Um, I have a bill to require, and I think I talked about this last month, to require um, uh, the students to get a high school diploma. I have to study civics. Basic stuff. The co-sponsor of the bill is Joe Benning, the Senate Republican leader. Uh, usually you want to get as many co-sponsors as you can for a bill. Joe was the first one I went to, and when I looked at our two names, I thought, this says it all. I, I, I will just do it as McCormick and Benning. Uh, and, the, and because what I think is, is that you can disagree with someone and still agree on the ground rules for how you deal with your disagreement. And um, uh, whatever differences there are between liberals and conservatives, we, presumably we all agree that we're under the authority of the, of the, the, the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, and then subject to that authority, the, the Vermont Constitution. Uh, presumably, we all understand there are three branches of government. There's a separation of powers. And those powers check each other, checks and balances. Those are basic things that a lot of Americans do not understand now. And it's pretty alarming. Um, I don't know if a republic can survive without citizens who fully understand Republican lowercase r, uh, Republican principles of, of government. Another project I'm on where I, I think I'm, I'm crashing and burning, frankly, and I don't think I'm going to get my way. Uh, there is an, am an amendment to the Vermont Constitution being proposed to remove, uh, originally it was to remove Vermont's prohibition on slavery. And people would think, well, why would we do that? We're proud of that. Vermont was the first, the Vermont Constitution, 1777, was the first ban on slavery in America. And it's something that Vermonters are very proud of. The reason people wanted to remove it was because they felt that the founders didn't do it, didn't really didn't do it right, because it prohibited slavery for anyone over 21. So implicitly, it sort of allowed for the possibility of, of, of slavery for people under 21. And um, my view is uh, nothing in history is perfect. I wish Thomas Jefferson had said all men and women are created equal. But he didn't. He said all men are created equal. It's imperfect. Nevertheless, the notion of equality is a good concept, and that this was a great step forward. So my view is, is, is you honor the good stuff in your history, and frankly, you, you face the uglier stuff head on. You just live with it. Uh, I know over my years as a, as a history teacher, I have been criticized uh, for um, you know running the country down because I would use texts and uh, give assignments that might draw my students' attentions to some of the darker side of our history. I've also been accused of perpetuating our patriotic myths and, and sugarcoating our history of racism and so on. And, and my answer is, you know, in either case, this study of history is not for the purpose of building patriotism or of tearing the country down. The purpose is to, study, to try to arrive at the truth and just tell the truth. And uh, uh, right now, the language in the Vermont Constitution prohibiting slavery is only there as an historical artifact. It's not, um, it's not law, because the federal constitution prohibiting slavery in 1865 makes, that, makes the Vermont prohibition uh, moot. It's there as, a, as an historical artifact. And my view is it should be left alone. And I think, over the long run, I think uh, that that view is going to prevail. Because the Vermont Constitution is difficult to amend. 
after the Senate is done with it, we need a two-thirds vote in the Senate, we'll likely get it. Then it goes to the House, and then it sits there, and in the next biennium, it gets taken up again. And if it passes a separate biennium, then it goes to a, a referendum, to the public vote. I can't imagine the people of Vermont agreeing to that. I think this is one of those things where the people are going to be wider, wiser than, than their quote-unquote leaders. Uh, but in any case, what, what, is, what is being proposed now is to leave the prohibition on slavery and just do away with the, with the over 21 part, which to me is altering the artifact. It's putting a smiling face on history. And uh, I say leave the good stuff, leave the bad stuff, take pride in the good stuff, face the bad stuff head on. Um, I bumped into Neil at the pizza shop the other night. Sorry. Commented uh, commented on my long windedness, so I'll end it off too. Sandy, now if you would. So um, uh, Dick was talking about the budget process. Um, the budget actually starts in the House, and um, House Appropriations is formally considering it right now. Um, what happens on the House side, and I don't know how much you guys do it over there, just um, is. Um, is that the um, is that the appropriations committee sends out sections of the budget to the policy committees to say because because ultimately how you spend money is 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 an expression of policy. It's when when we think when we decide to spend X amount of money for childcare, we're saying we think that that high quality childcare is important, um, and and that's a policy decision. So so. The policy questions are we, we get a chance to weigh in. Now what's interesting, so every year every year my committee writes a memo to um, the House Appropriations Committee analyzing various pieces of the budget. Um, uh, what we can't do in there is say, gee, we think that you should ha add 10 million here and 10 million there and 10 million in another place. And they say, thank you very much. And they go back to what they have in front of them, which is always much more modest. So this year, um, the governor's proposed budget, and as Dick said, that's sort of what we, that's, that ends up being, that ends up being sort of the rough draft that we start with. And we, and we say, okay, what do we think of the draft? Um, his, his proposed budget actually adds $2 million to um, the Department for Children and Families um, to address uh, issues around the op opioid crisis. We've heard a lot about that. Um, you know, we hear about we hear about overdoses. We hear about people in hospitals. But the other piece of it is that there are a lot of children that are impacted by that because um, of, of, I'll, I'll pick on women, but a woman who is drug seeking is probably not taking very good care of her baby. And so, as a consequence, we have had. Um, um, a, a, a disproportionate share of the kids coming into custody now are babies. Once upon, if you had asked 15 years ago, you know, children, children in state custody, what's the what's the age bracket? Uh, most of them were adolescents because that's when they 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 go out of control and the parent says, "Oh my God, I'm not I'm not in control of this child." And somehow they come into and then they come into state custody and go to a foster family. Um, but what we're, what we're seeing now is we're seeing um, an, a, a much greater percentage of, of infants, children, children who, are, who are less than two years old, so infants and toddlers. Um, and, and so then the question becomes, well, what do we do? You know, where, where do we put our resources to address that? And, and one of the places that, that actually addresses that very well um, is a um, a, a consortium of groups around the state called Parent Child Centers. Um, they are set up to um, to work with with families. Um, one of one of the one of the more interesting programs that, that they have is something called Learning Together, which is which is um, teen parents and their babies, and they come together and and team up. You know, a 16 year old mother. Can be can get her high school diploma, um, and her baby is there with her in in the facility, and all the babies are together, and the, and the young mothers are together. That's one of the things they do, but they do lots of other things. And um, so the governor's budget would would give us would give us two million in new money, 
but but um, he is proposing that it be directed exclusively to expanding um, the number of state social workers who deal with families. And one of the problems with that is that when we increase the number of social workers, then the, then the, the courts say, oh my goodness, we're going to need more judges. And the public defender's office says, oh my goodness, we're going to need more lawyers. And so there's, there's a concern that that's going to um, uh, put pressures on other parts of the budget where there isn't more money. So one of the things that, that we're looking at is, is how, we can, how we can take that two million in new money and use it most effectively to address um, the needs of, of that group. So one, one idea on the table is instead of new social workers, we would, we would, we would allow them to have more aids. Um, now, what happens now is that when you have a child in custody, um, the court says, so, so child's in custody has, goes to, to um, lives with a foster family, but there's court order visitation with one or both, with one or both um, natural parents. So, well, how does the kid get there? And does, and does somebody, you know, do we, do we mistrust mom enough that we want that, that visitation to be supervised? Because that's, that's labor intensive. And so how are, we prop, how are we using the social workers? So the concept is to, um, um, is, is maybe, we put, like, maybe we put some more money into the aids, and maybe we look more closely at the parent-child centers and say, what can we do to increase their capacity so that they can work with, with families on the ground? I've talked before about what we call our community partners. Um, mental health, uh, Claire Martin is the great, great example of community partner, the, the mental health agencies across the state. We have many, many places, or even the community hospitals, to be perfectly honest, because, because we use, because that's where the Medicaid, that's where our Medicaid program runs through. We have many places where we rely on um, community nonprofits to accomplish government objectives. Uh, and we do it by contract, we do it by fee for service, we have various structures that, that, that happen to make that happen. What we don't do is, is properly fund them. So we set it up and we say, oh, this is great, um, designated Claire Martin Center, we want you to take care of everybody who presents with, with a mental health issue, um, but we're not going to give you any more money this year than we did last year, or the year before that, or the year before that. And of course, with, with costs going up, either either they, they lose staff, they, they lose staff because they can't pay them, because the people go where they're going to get more money. So one of the things that happens is that we end up with, with excessive turnover in those places, which makes their, makes their services less effective. So we always have to be looking at how are we making this effective. So that's one of the pieces that my committee is looking at. Um, the other big thing that I've been working on, um, I'm sure you heard in the news, that we passed um, the abortion bill last week. Um, it passed in the House on a vote of 106 to 37. Um, and what that does is it basically codifies what has been Vermont law since actually before Roe Ro versus Wade, because before Roe Ro versus Wade, the, the law that Vermont had was found unconstitutional. So it's been more than 45 years that there has been no restriction on abortion in Vermont. And despite the fact that there is no restriction, uh, most abortion is done within the first nine weeks of, of pregnancy, and it's done with medication, and it's done in a clinic. Um, a few cases require um, a, a, a more intrusive procedure. There are no, and I will repeat that, there are no elective abortions in Vermont in the third trimester. There is nobody in Vermont that does that. It's actually kind of a specialized service, and if you only did it once every five years, you wouldn't be good at it, so it doesn't happen here. Um, the, um, the, the probably the most difficult part of the debate um, centered around the concern that um, a woman could be eight and a half months pregnant and wake up one morning and say, gosh, I think I've changed my mind. I don't want to be a mother. Now, I, 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 did, I'm, I, had, I haven't had children. But I just can't imagine how you would, how you could be pregnant and live with that for eight months or nine months and, and fix up the nursery and start collecting things and start looking at names 
and then change your mind. To be, to be perfectly honest, I find that argument disrespectful, disrespectful of women. It really is. We'll, we'll do it in a minute. Um, but even if, even if there was this, I'm going to call her crazy woman that everybody seems to be focused on, she has to find a medical provider. Well, you know what? Medical providers have, they have licenses, and they have a scope of practice, and they have ethics that, that affect what they do. Um, so, so even if she found, it, how is she going to find a medical provider who would do that and risk his or her license? It's not, you know, and if the only, the only place that, that, that later term abortions happen after, after 21 weeks, the only place that abortions happen in Vermont is at the University of, Met, of Vermont Medical Center. And there, um, uh, at 22 weeks and six days, anyone, any, any um, uh, medical professional who is proposing an abortion on a patient must present it to a, a, a panel of, of ethicists and pediatricians and others who, who, who say yes or no. So it's not this, this, the notion of the woman, the woman can't do it herself, and the woman and a doctor can't do it. So it just, it doesn't happen. Um, and it was, it was our feeling that, um, that it was really important to keep this option open. I think, I think what was most interesting to me, I'm old enough that, that I remember, I remember back, I remember back alley abortions. I remember people, I had a friend who had to fly to Mexico. Uh, so, you know, rich people flew somewhere and poor people found somebody, you know, in a dark alley. Um, but what I noticed in talking to some of my younger colleagues is, um, is the number of women now, well actually all women of childbearing age, grew up with safe and legal abortion and they can't imagine anything else. So for that reason I was proud to vote for the bill. Now in that bill you said that in nowhere in Vermont that uh Healthcare providers are given long-term abortions, but was that put in the bill to shorten term? No, limits? because it doesn't. It doesn't. No it good. doesn't happen. So that it can happen now if doctors decide that it, they want it. It could have happened for the last 45 years. For the last 45. But years. But by it not being in there, it makes it more probable to be no. able to happen. No, I don't believe it does. I don't believe it does. It's we we have the, it's it's exactly we are exactly where we've been for 45 years. Yeah, and then in passing such a bill, it was my understanding that Vermont had a shortfall of members for people. That why would we want to get rid of our future generation? It's not. I think it's it's a, it's a person's parents, mothers. I, I want I want I want children to be wanted. Right. And then with such a growing population of uh, gay and lesbian couples in the state of Vermont that I presume are unable to have children, that there's other a lot more actually, options actually available. Quite a, actually, quite a few um, uh, actually quite a few lesbian couples do do uh, find a way. If they adopt or they have uh, uh, artificial insemination. There are quite a few quite a, quite a few gay gay couples are parents. In the legislature, our majority leader, Becca Ballant, has two children. We have, we, have, we have a senator. I apologize, Barnard was oh, a whiteout yeah. and very slow. So you know, you never know. You go through whole different countries as you drive around. It's like around. summer here, quite frankly. <laughs> where I, come from. I thought I was going to have you folks to myself because it was so Coming icy. Over killing. So, I, know. so, so I'll, yeah, I, I will turn it over, yes. Okay. Well, good morning, sorry, I was late also. Um, oh, good morning. Um, you know, it's really very nice here, but quite frankly, it's lousy <laughs> in other places. But, you know, given what weather came down, I'd say the highway department did a good job. So I'm Alice Nitka, I think I've met a lot of you. Um, I'm serving on the Appropriations Committee, which Bill, Bill. Uh, Dick tells me he um, described that process, and I'm also on the Judiciary Committee, um, which deals with 
a number of laws, things that have a penalty. Um, it, it's, it's hard to know exactly what comes in there, like uh, a lot of stuff does. And I'm also uh, right at this current few months right now, I'm working on judicial retention, which I'm head of that committee, which is dealing with um, the review of our judges in the state. In other words, in Vermont, the majority of judges all of our, well, I'd say the Supreme Court, the Superior Court judges, what used to be the District Court judges, are all appointed by the governor. And then every six years, there's a review of their situation. In other words, we don't elect those judges at all, as they do in some states. We only elect in Vermont probate judges and the side judges, or assistant judges, they're called. But all the other judges, come through something called judicial retention. So every six years, they file, the, our committee requests that they file documents with regard to, um, well, what we send out are surveys to attorneys that have appeared before them, court personnel, and other people that are affiliated with the courts to evaluate how they're doing. And they also um, submit uh, financial statements and they submit samples of their court decisions. And then we review all of that as to how that judge is doing. In other words, nobody checks on this. Not like they get an oil change at three years or anything. They, there's no review of how they're doing until six years is up. Now, somebody who's been appointed to fill somebody's retiring term might come up in three years and might come up even in one year. So they go through this process, and then they come in to a hearing before us. It's an eight-member committee, four House members, four Senate members. And then, you know, and respond to what these questionnaires are anonymous, so that you know if someone wants to write something, they they want to be honest. We want them to be honest rather than, you know, but they might have to appear before a judge in the future. So they we don't want people saying who they are, because that would prejudice the judge when they appear before them. So we're going through that now. We're doing um, nine judges right now. We did um, five. Well. We're doing them as, you know, there's several meetings that they have to come to, and then we have a public hearing which is happening this Wednesday at 7 o'clock at the State House, so anybody can come in and discuss any of these judges, speak to us about any of these judges that they feel are doing a great job, feel are doing a crappy job, feel they did whatever, that they're, you know, maybe someone's a terrible alcoholic, the beer's drunk in court, whatever, I don't have quite that happen, but, you know, there are certainly complaints about judges. And some of them this time were, um, some were, you know, the judges um, very biased toward men, biased toward women, um, condescending in court, an absolute jerk, does good, <laughs> does good legal opinions, um, you know, isn't well versed in the law. All kinds of things come in, and then um, after we hear from the public, then there's another review of them to go over, you know, what we feel. You know, if there's an area where they need improvement, you know, we're working with the chief judge too, and he might recommend, and we might recommend, um, you know, re-education in some areas, um, being mentored by another judge, um, you know, all kinds of different things, getting into, getting into some counseling for their, or med medical stuff for their health, if that's an issue, or if they did have an alcohol problem, to work on that. We could, and then we present the information that we've obtained before the House and the Senate together, and there's a vote as to whether to retain them or not. And it's taken a lot of money and effort to educate them. You don't want to just throw them out. And they themselves say it takes about three years um, to really get good on the bench. Because some of, they're appearing in all kinds of courts. In other words, they're in civil court, where there are lawsuits you know, between neighbors or corporations or whatever. There are some lawyers who haven't practiced in that field when they get appointed. Some just do criminal work. And, and in, when, they are, when they become a judge now, they're circulating around on the circuit, all around the state, um, and dealing with different courts. In other words, they're in criminal, they're in family, they're in civil. Um, they're in treatment courts. Treatment courts, domestic violence courts. Um, so it's really, um, and some of them get in there, and you know they're just learning. They're, they start hearing cases. Know, like right away, and so they really have to get educated. And you know, they sometimes they do well. One judge came in who she, she's new; she's been on the job about a year, and she came in and she 
had done a, been a lawyer for like 20 years, but hadn't done anything in civil court, especially with regard to labor. So she had a big case with regard to labor, and she did all kinds of research, tried to get very up to speed, which, you know, you can't really just write out of the gate. So she put out a thing to other judges and said, you know, if you had a case, anything like this, you know, send them an email. And so a couple responded, and they said, well, so-and-so just wrote a decision just, just like this. So she, in the end, she said, um, you know, use that lawyer's material and, said, and gave credit in her decision to that lawyer in that case and everything. Anyway, it was appealed to the Supreme Court, and she said, well, guess what? It was overturned, so it was the lawyer she copied from. So, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting process, but um, I'd say generally they're doing a very good job. It's a very, very hard job in that you've got to get these decisions in a timely manner finished and out there. And that, that's the biggest complaint, is that they don't get their decisions done as timely as they want to even, because they're being moved from court to court. So anyway, that's what's going on with the judges, in case you ever appear before them. Um, what else are we working on? Well, working on the budget, of course. And one thing that's in the budget that you might be interested in for schools is the lead testing of the water in schools. The state did a pilot with, um, I think, 15 or 16 schools, and lead was discovered in those schools, in their water. And it could have come from the faucet itself, could have been in the pipes or whatever. So the state is going to be testing all the schools. The state will be paying for it. They aren't going to do the physical test, but they're going to pay for it, and it will be done locally. And the state will help like the local school. They might have somebody who can do it get an outside person, but the, the plan is, and the governor had this in his budget too, is to test every single school, and then there will be remediation. The state's paying for all the testing. You know, it might just be in the lead and solder and, and faucet or something, so some of it may be minor, just change the faucets, or in some schools where it's only in one faucet, you might stop using that drinking faucet and uh, shut that one off, provided you had other water in the school for drinking. There may be a need for bottled water in some schools until it gets all done. And then the remediation, and then there's money put in for the budget adjustment, which we just did. Um, I think we have 1.3 million in there for doing that. And then the cost of the remediation might, some of it will be simply paid for by the faucet being fixed, but other might be more extensive. It's also for daycare centers and registered daycare homes. So if you have a private home that's doing childcare, um, they'll be eligible to have the free testing as well, and some help with the remediation. The idea, and the governor supported this, was, was his idea. I mean, it was everybody's idea to do the testing, but um, he wants it done in a year. Originally, the department said, Department of Health said, well, we're not going to be able to get that done in a year, but the plan is get it done in the year. You know, children shouldn't be drinking um, water that has lead in it. I mean, obviously, a lot of homes have some lead in their water, but not shouldn't be giving it to them in schools. And there will, I think it's down to 0.3 microliters. I mean, I'm not that work, but that's yeah, But doesn't a and R already require, like all, <coughs> oh. all agency natural resources yeah. requires right now, delis, pizza joints, all these places, uh, private enterprises to test the water all the time. So, yeah. and we all do it. Okay. So I don't really see why it would be uh, like a janitor in school to, Got to submit it and do you know through the 48-hour thing. Why that would be such a big deal to for them to adhere to those same rules? I think I think that the uh, if you're on a municipal water supply and that's tested, that is usually sufficient for lots of public public use. Facilities. But it wouldn't like addressing what she's talking about. Water fountains, dispense. Yeah. You know we're all in public system here in Bethel. Our school yeah. was supported just like everything in the infrastructure here. But your so, school could have lead in like the faucet. The, right, I agree. So that's why I'm saying yeah. had it been taken, like, like at our little school, Mr. Hubble who just acknowledged 37 years in the building, very confident uh -huh. uh, kind of guy that could do this little kit yeah. and get it in 48 hours and, uh, yeah, so maybe and answer those questions. That's you know? maybe how that will occur. I mean, well, I would, you know, I would think. Not to have, you don't have to necessarily hire somebody to come in and have right, well, there. And yeah. they'll pay for it. Yeah, so. we all have to, so. Yeah. In private. Yes, but you're right. The town would say, "Hey, if we 
we've got good water and no lead in it, but the fact is it could be a faucet. Oh, right. Side. That's why I'm saying you yeah. got to go to the end of the spectrum. Yes, you can't, right. Uh, you've got to check every faucet. Right, right. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I think that's a good thing. I think the, the, the sooner we get it done, the better. So that's a couple of things going on. So, Neil, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Sorry, it, it, just like Alice, it was slow and uh, white out and coming over from Bethel. I'm Allison Clarkson. I uh, have the honor of serving you uh, in the morning on Senate Economic Development, Housing, and General Affairs. Hi, Wayne. Hey. It's good to see you both. Um, and in the afternoon, I serve on government operations. and. This is the biennium that we are able to deal with constitutional amendments. So I'll start with the afternoon because government operations doesn't always get a lot of attention. Uh, but this is the, the year that we can deal with election. Any changes we make in the election law uh, has to be done this year. It has to be enacted by the end of this year so that it uh, can affect the next cycle. So we're looking at a range of uh, election law, you know, modest election law changes, um, and they range from a very high profile one. Ethan Sonnenberg, you may remember, ran at age 13 for governor, and you know, is that, I mean, he, he was pointing out, he ran <coughs> in part at, to point out that this was a possibility, and you know, do we, is, is that worth <coughs> taking? Uh, uh, voters' time and <clears throat> votes away from uh, candidates who really are able to serve. So while he was able to run, he would not have been able to serve. So we're, you know, we're discussing everything from the age of a candidate uh, for statewide office uh, to uh, whether you can double dip, whether you can run in a primary as a major party candidate and then <clears throat> turn around and run as something else after the primary. So. We're exploring a whole range. I think we probably have 15 issues that uh, individuals have sent to us, that uh, that the Secretary of State wants to raise, that the clerks that the clerks have raised. You know, it's just, so we're it's a catch-all. And if you're interested, uh, as we go through that uh, discussion, feel free to be in touch with our committee assistant, and I can give you that. Uh, we're also interestingly looking at. A number of the con uh, of the amendments to the Constitution. The most high-profile one you may have read about is the slavery uh, reference in Article One, and we've learned a lot about that. Where uh, you know we're all very proud of the fact that we're the first state in the con in in the country to prohibit slavery, but there was a second fa uh, phrase in that uh, uh, article that people, I would now probably say mis, misinterpreted, is that a fair way of putting it, Dick? Who's our constitutional scholar in the Senate? Um, to meaning that if you were under 21, you could still be enslaved in this state. And Peter Teacher, we've had great witnesses, Dick being one of them, as an adjunct professor and a constitutional scholar, Dick, uh, feels very strongly that we should leave it as it is, that it's a historic, that the, uh, that, um, the amendment, the 13th Amendment, has prohibited slavery federally, and that there is really no need to change this. Uh, and, and, and Dick falls down on the side of leaving it for historicity's sake. And uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of our constituents all over the, the state that really want us to address this issue and to clarify the language so that we make it clear that slavery in all forms is prohibited. So that's a very interesting debate. And one of the reasons I think it's exciting to be a legislator is that it's just you never know what you're going to learn new things about. And you know, every bill, every issue we take up is like a little graduate course in that subject. And, uh, and the discussion of how something affects the people of the state and how the state and the people, its people interact, it's, it never ceases to be. Uh, it's never dull. And the other constitutional amendment that is in our committee at the moment, there are, we have two years so that they can be proposed right through and enact and worked on right through uh, the end of next year. It's one of the few powers that the Senate has alone. 
the Senate has confirmation powers and the Senate has constitutional amendment powers. So that we are the only body that actually, and correct me guys if I'm yeah. wrong on this, but I, um, the Senate alone does testimony and work and proposes, passes a constitutional amendment and then it goes to the House. The House can only vote on it. They are not able to change it. You may have created the Senate. The House <laughs> created the Senate, but the Senate makes gets to propose constitutional amendments. So the other one that is in our committee at the moment that we'll be taking up and discussing in the next week or so is uh, the proposal to, are the proposals, and there are a couple of them, to change the governor's uh, term of office to four years as opposed to two, and one also includes the Senate. Um, so there are varying feelings about that. I actually feel I'm a very strong believer that we need to have three separate and equal branches of state government. And at the moment, the legislative branch is at the greatest disadvantage, serving only four and a half months a year. Uh, we already have an executive branch that is full time. And uh, if they, you know, I just think, wow, what a luxury of time to have a whole year with full time paid staff. They can accomplish a huge amount already. And uh, to give them an increased advantage to me uh, really continues to skew the lack of equity between the three branches of um, the judicial, the legislative, and the executive. So we all come to it with our different points of view, and that will be a very interesting conversation. Uh, I am vice chair of Senate Economic Development, Housing, and General Affairs. And this year, we're dealing doing a few, uh, two big housing uh, bills. One, we are proposing doing a, another uh, bond on another housing bond. We'll be in a bit of a battle probably with the treasurer on this, who is a very, who's very protective of our of whatever liability and risk we put the state at, and yet we also need we need so much housing. Um, we are. Our last $35 million housing bond, which we did two years ago, is, is pretty much all committed at the moment, and new projects are happening all over. Some affordable, some market rate, some mixed, a mixed variety of housing. But uh, as those of you who've read the Futures Project report, it, it, uh, which identifies the fact that we have 11,000 unfilled jobs, we also have thousands and thousands of units needed in housing around the state. Uh, in rural Vermont, in urban Vermont, all over. And uh, so we're talking about a new housing model, we're talking about short-term rentals, uh, and Airbnb, trying uh, our compliance efforts to try and get all, everyone who uh, rents a room or rents an apartment uh, to comply with the, the rooms tax and uh, health and safety. We have big issues, some, some places are better uh, you know, so we have an inspection issue on, uh, and an e equitable playing field on, uh, on, rental, ha uh, on rentals in the state. Um, we also are looking at, uh, well, anyway, so there are two big housing uh, bills which uh, will also, so I ran the volunteer response to Irene in Woodstock, and one of our biggest problems was we had no idea where the open units were, where the where there might be rooms for people to move into as we tried to move them out of homes that were completely devastated. And you had the same problem here in Bethel. One of the things we have called on since Irene is a rental registry where every rental unit is registered and people can know how to find them, in, in particularly in cases of emergency. Uh, very, very helpful. And uh, also on in inspections uh, for for safety and health reasons. Um, we also have just passed out the minimum wage bill, which we have done again. Um, the the uh, so that is passed first reading in in the well, second reading in the Senate. It's very similar to last year's minimum wage bill. Um, and uh, this time we call for a study on tip minimum wage. And for many of us, wanted to move to one wage for everybody, and uh, because the there are some real issues around the tip wage that people don't always think about. Um, the federal tip minimum wage and our tip minimum wage is ha our, in Vermont. Our tip minimum wage is half what the full minimum wage is. The challenge is that most tip 
wage workers are women, about 80% of them, 80% uh, of them, uh, and there are, as one might imagine, uh, real power disparities in, in how they're paid and, ter and, and sexual harassment and just unpleasantness that they endure to, to get that tip. And uh, many of us would like to liberate tip wage workers from having, uh, from having that experience in their work. And we, so we are looking, there'll be a study, I hope, uh, looking at tip wage workers and what we might do about it. And sub-minimum wage, which we also don't think about, but I bet Dave thinks about it, which is uh, student workers. So at the moment, there's a differential between how they're paid during the uh, summer. When they're not in school, they're paid uh, our state minimum wage. But in the fall, during the course of the school year, um, they are only paid the federal minimum wage, uh, which I'll remind you is only $7.25 an hour. When you're trying to pay for college, which many of these kids are trying to pay for programs, apprenticeship programs, trainings of all varieties, Motivated kids are working, and those kids tend to be the kids that are taking advantage of a, an accredited degree of some variety, um, whether it's college or uh, a year program at VTC, whatever it is. That is so expensive that it is, it struck many of us. And, and sadly, the growth rate in poverty in this state is between 18 and 24 year olds. and. Many of our young people in high school are contributing significantly to their family and family incomes, and so that is another reason uh, that we're wanting to um, to look at that sub-minimum wage. Well, let me just add something else, and yeah. before you add it, so right now the minimum wage on January first went up to ten seventy-eight. Ten seventy-eight. It was ten fifty before, and it's going up based upon. Uh, cost of living, right? Right, CPI. CPI. That's how it's been set up to go up every year. So by the time, this is the $15 minimum wage, and everybody goes, yikes. But the fact is, it wouldn't be until, as proposed right now, 2024. It's not 2024, so it gives quite a ways out. And the difference between what would have happened in 2024 under the CPI versus what would happen if it moves to 15 then, I think is only about $2.36. It's two, about $2. Right. So it's not a great as great a jump as it sounds when you think of fifteen dollars like well, it's fifteen you know. over five years. Right. So but the gradual increase as it would have been under the CPI, the difference as right. is, it is there is there any uh, sorry, what what's your name? My name's Dan McCullough. But uh, my question is when you touched on ten seventy eight and then falling back on the federal with employees, and I mean, I, I can't speak for Dave, but, no, I I'm, business, I'm just, but I'm just simply saying the reality in our business right now. Well, what's your business? I have a sea store and I also have an excavation company, but the reality of it is I don't have a person in my business that's less than 13 bucks an hour. Right. So if I had a great employee at 1078 and it said, well, you're going to school in September, I'm going to cut you to 768. That employee, I will see the back of them <clears> as they walk away. So that's, in reality, my question is, how many people in this database in Vermont are actually going back to the mill? That's what they'll find out in the study. And I, did, I can't believe there's 10 I people. Think there's I, I don't think there's 10 people. I, I don't disagree. So I don't, I mean, I don't disagree. <laughs> it's a possibility, though. Yeah. And, I, and that's what they'll find out in the study. When we have only four and a half months to serve, Sadly, we didn't have the time to dive in to the I'm, You know, I, as an employer, just touching on the $15, I'm, I don't have an issue with it. You can't live in Vermont 15 bucks an hour. Well, you can't live here. Correct. And that's why you can't this out. community right here has lost. And, when, and she touched on it when she said that, you know, we, we don't, we're, we're losing people. We don't want to lose judges for higher pay. We're losing our kids out of the state because you can't live here and pay a $4,000 property tax, a mortgage, car insurance, and the rest. And, that, and, definitely and student debt. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges we face, particularly, right. I just wrote about this this week. Um, but you have to have that job debt. for that student debt. We're not right. Chittenden County. Very hard to build a business in Windsor County here to have uh, dealer.com or... Uh, well, these actually, things. it's... Uh, so. Uh, our president pro tem of the Senate has pushed all the committees to do field trips. So we did a field trip to Bradford where we were in a maker yep. co-worker space, terrific, called um, The Space on Main. And it, uh, we heard from people all over Vermont about the rural economy. It was set up by Matt Dunn. I mean, he did a great 
first presentation on rural America and rural Vermont. And one of the biggest challenges we face is we have lost, as we all know, population in rural Vermont, not so much in, in more urban Vermont, but that's only Burlington, <coughs> and even that is still considered rural by the rest of America. I agree, but not Vermont. Right, but not by us. And um, so all those issues we are, are looking at, what can the state do, what can individual businesses do, but creating that, um, the excitement of what's happening in Bethel, in Springfield, in Bradford, uh, the, the assets we have, we have huge assets also in rural Vermont. And so for young people who do have jobs who are here and who could work remotely, we desperately need to get the uniform high-speed internet. We, but we have fabulous housing. It needs renovation, it needs weatherization, but we have great housing. Springfield has the highest gigabyte capacity in the state. Um, and it has huge, as we know, gorgeous, unused, ma old manufacturing space. So there are lots of assets. We need to figure out how to leverage all those assets to, to make ourselves economically competitive to the west side. So everyone's aware of it. We now need to make it happen. I mean, and it's happening, as we know, in small ways and very exciting ways uh, to hear Matt talk about his if, if you're interested, you should go to his website. Uh, well, his, he started something called the Center on Rural Innovation in Heartland. He already has 11 employees. But that space had no employees where he's working now. So I mean, it's exciting. He is cre he's creating a center that all of rural America is tapping into because he's, he's, um, um, he's created a website, interactive maps. Uh, take a peek at it. It's very interesting uh, work. He's also putting putting his money where his mouth is, creating this Black River Innovation Campus in Springfield. Uh, they in the, and they are in the process. He's bought one building. They're in the process of buying the Park Street School. They're going to have a live work uh, campus where people work remotely, where people can work in groups. There'll be a maker space. There's a huge interactive, the old theater there yeah, that is work. stunning. Yeah, both um, all work. I mean, my daughter went to RPI, and they spent you know hundreds of millions of dollars where they're in for you know, a campus yeah. development, incubator space. You're doing great. You're out of here, you know, and here comes a new student in with a new idea or whatever. And they have a whole bunch of them. But, I mean, you have exceptional kids there. I think all the kids, even our little community of Bethel, as far as being tech savvy, they're smartphone savvy, oh. they are there. They're yeah. already there. We're reluctant, or, or I shouldn't say reluctant, we're, we're not addressing it and pushing them out there right. to challenge that as, as a Well, school. and now Springfield, every student next year, beginning next year, every uh, high school student will graduate knowing how to code. And, and the real, real digital and internet, and real digital economy skills being uh, being uh, well, they're going to be educated with 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 these skills. And um, the anyway, it's, a, it's very exciting. And they, he's raised a, a huge amount of money already to get well, this. You know, I'm concerned about GW as a major yes. employer in our community here. And there, you know, in my little convenience store, I really challenge. I mean, I have a 77-year-old employee. I have three employees that have been with me almost 30 years. They're into their 50s and 60s. In a C-store, that's kind of, but it's very difficult to find young people yes. to work. And GW over there with what they're trying to address or whatever, and, then, and I'm not a fan of the border and the wall and all this stuff. You know, I think we need to open these things up to get these people in here that want, you know, that want quote, unquote, the American dream. Yeah. But I mean, if we lose an employer like GW because of high utilities, all these other things, and then they can't staff the building, mm -hmm. which is, is I think, kind of a reality. So yeah. I mean, they're working very closely, of course, with Vermont with schools Tech. and stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah and, no. and if you're going to Vermont Tech, you are just about guaranteed a, a job. job. I don't know anybody that comes out of there that doesn't hasn't right. been offered jobs. Right. Like, and NGW does terrific upscaling, awesome. uh, upscaling work. They train. People, as you know, as everybody here knows, they right. do a terrific job. Yeah. So we um, need those young people training. to stay here. Yeah. We got to keep them. Well, in Vermont, yeah. that, a lot of that is with the Vermont Training Program through the uh, Agency of Commerce and Community Development. We're working very closely with GW. Uh, and have the state has invested a huge yeah, amount in GW yeah. uh, in training, in training programs, in incent all sorts of incentives. So, I mean, we should be proud of that. Hi. Blaine has a question. Uh, uh, Mason Wade, I'm sorry I'm not Mason, I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm wearing a couple of different hats today as a constituent. Um, Alice, 
Uh, can you, and we're talking about assets over here. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you, you were on the committee for the regulation of the Senate Committee for Regulation of Marijuana, and you voted no on that. Can you explain the no vote? Sure. Um, I, I've been on the Judiciary Committee for a number of years. Marijuana has been there. It's now this year being called cannabis. I always called it recreational marijuana to distinguish it from medical marijuana, which I fully support. Medical marijuana has been very successful in terms of many people with different kinds of illnesses. It's gotten people off of opioids who were, I can think of someone who was in a car accident as an 11-year-old was on opioids. Extreme pain and problems with her body for many, many years was able to transition off to medical marijuana. It's been helping a lot of people. The average age of that is 58. One of the problems is the people at the dispensary become very close to the persons who come in there to get, and you can buy there, not just marijuana smoke, you can buy saps, tinctures, um, edibles, and it's really been, I think, a godsend for many people. Um, now, and it, two, let's see, where we two years ago, the Senate passed a tax and regulate for recreational marijuana that the governor Let's see, did it get, that didn't get through the House, right? Okay, so that didn't. But what did go through, let's see, uh, this last year or the year before, was uh, possession of two ounces. You had to grow, you had to validate it. Grow your own. Two ounces of marijuana in your possession. And the ability to have two adult plants, plants and four immature plants. What was lacking was um, you weren't able to sell it to other persons. So now this year in Senate Judiciary, Senator Sears is the chairman of that committee. He wants a tax and regulated system. And he, you know, there's, so that you can, he wants people to be able to buy because Massachusetts has passed um, recreational marijuana that you can purchase in stores. And that's happening right in Great Barrington, just south of where um, Senator Sears lives. It's happening in Northampton, Mass. So kind of all around down there, it's you can get you can get recreational marijuana. And then this bill, a woman came and she says, I can't find that thing anywhere on the internet. Well, it's called cannabis now. So that's where you need to look. And there wasn't a cross reference to marijuana. So in the committee, we took a lot of testimony. I have to coming into the committee and knowing this was going to be there this year. I said, well. I'm going to really look at that because if we have recreational marijuana in terms of the two ounces, um, you know, and people are, and there's some money to be made to, to address the issue of um, education about opioids and other things that, uh, you know, I'll take a look at being able to have tax and regulate. So I did. I considered all the testimony that was in there um, right until the very end. I didn't know how I would vote on it. In the end, right before the vote, I said, I'm not going to vote for it because there are some things I wanted. I wanted the current dispensaries who do the medical to be able to be the first to roll out recreational because they have the facilities. Um, it's, it's a proven system that works. It's under the Department of Public Safety. This would not be. This would be under a board of commissioners who would lay out all the regulations, et cetera. And I thought, well, even so, I think you could, if you did it, allowing them to roll out first before it was the general licenses, that you'd have a smoother rollout, you could see what the flaws are, the new commission could kind of work from there. But that amendment um, in, that I tried to do in the committee failed. So I decided in the end, well, I'm not crazy about how this commission is going to work. I think I'm a little bit worried about it. So I decided to vote no. I voted against recreational marijuana previously. I was a social worker all of my life here in Vermont for a zillion years working with children, a lot of them starting to smoke at 12 and 13. And quite frankly, I don't want a lot more marijuana. It's available in homes now, but not as many as it would be should it be just simply can buy it on the street. And also, I live in a recreation town where Okemo Mountain is, where we have tons of young people. You know, our town is 1,900 people. On a weekend, it's 17,000. And, you know, if you can buy it right on the main street in Ludlow, It'll be a mess unless there's some really tight controls. And you know, that's going to happen, I think, at some point anyway, whether I like it or not. But I thought, well, I'll see what happens. And if there are changes that um, it will pass the Senate, this bill that's um, coming up on the floor next week, next week or the week after. And I don't know what will happen in the House. Also, don't know what the governor will do. Because the governor wants a way to determine if somebody has 
better than what the system is now for determining if you have marijuana in your system that is causing you to be impaired um, when you're driving. So who knows? Oh, I, I think, you know, may well pass, may not when it gets to the house. The big challenge is going to be the house. And the dog. Right? I mean, although Sam Young says he has the votes for it. You got a lot of co-sponsors. He did. Uh, there's a House member who has, um, a former colleague of mine on House Ways and Means, has introduced the tax and regulate bill uh, in the House and has got a lot of co-sponsors. And we, they may actually be able to pass it. I mean, the reason I, I actually support the tax and regulate system, because I think one of our biggest challenges is that we cannot regulate the consistency and the quality of, of marijuana, and, and, and that is terrifying when you think of what can be laced into this drug that our eighth graders are able to get. The plus for me of tax and regulate is that eighth graders won't, it won't be so easy uh, for uh, young people to get the drug. We will have an age limit just like we do with alcohol. We have a, uh, we worked in government operations to design the cannabis board that would uh, be over a year putting together the, uh, the oversight and the management of this, sort of like the liquor and lottery board. We're a control state. It would be similar uh, to that. And I have confidence that we could actually uh, improve things, which, which I would really like to see. Uh, I, I, I don't feel pressured by other states. I feel pressured by our own need to have uh, uh, safety in the, in, the, in the drugs that are available to, to our, our Vermonters. And um, so, I mean, that, that really compels me. And I think prohibition has failed us completely. Prohibition failed with alcohol, prohibition is failed with drugs. And uh, I would rather have us be honest, own it, and uh, have safer drugs that people can buy. I would add to that, um, in addition to making sure that the product is safe, what I would like to do is see us cut the cord with the black market. Yes, absolutely. Because that's the people right now, yes. the people on the street who are selling cannabis, or whatever we call it, are also selling other stuff. Yes. And if we don't have anybody dealing with those folks, then then they're they're not going to have as, as much of a market for their other wares, and they may decide to go away. Um, so I really think I think you know we'll never we'll never make it disappear, but I think we can really make cripple inroads. the black market with yeah. with a good legalization plan. I also want to. I don't agree with any of you, but holy shit! <laughs> so you know, I agree with you too. The black market. <laughs> Dave, Eddie, it's amazing. The people selling on the black market presently, of course, don't want to tax and regulate because they want to continue to sell and make a profit. You know, so it's like, you know, so there's a lot to it. It's not uh, I, here we are. We. Um, yeah, same page. You know, well, I appreciate what you said as a social worker and the effect that yeah. you saw with minors, eighth graders. And my concern with an eighth grade, that is the make or break as a person <coughs> in society in general. Are you going to be a contributor? Are you going to be somebody in the back of the... And that's where you're going to lose that. I appreciate what you're saying with quality and all that stuff. But at the same time, like I said, I'll go back. Kids are smart. So, I mean, if you don't, uh, I just think we need to, be, I respect you for voting no. Actually, but I think what House we, and what Clarkson we, put and in you have in Colorado, you them. have every state around Colorado. My dog's in Colorado. I went the RPI to, one? Yeah, yeah, she didn't come back. When, what year did she graduate from RPI? Uh, 04. Oh, but they never come she's back. She's a grown up. Yeah, she's got, she's got a five year old and a three year old now. Wow. And she's, I'm not concerned about her kids. They have a good chance they aren't even going to go to public school because of her family and stuff. But and that bothers me. But at the same time, you know, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, they all got serious amount of litigation against Colorado because Colorado's sitting there raking in millions of dollars. And letting it go across dollars. the border to their state. But these kids are coming, just like we used to do, and that can kind of tell you this. We go to New York because we could drink and come back to Vermont and get you in, you know, in Fairhaven, you know, and like, why? Because we couldn't drink in 21 Vermont. Yeah, so that's my concern with this. And Dick Sears is probably seeing this in, in, yeah. in uh, or over the border, mass coming home. What did they used to call Route 4? It was a suicide alley. They were something like that. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just want to say, I, I think there is no really, if you're, if you're involved in government, there are times when you just have to have a high tolerance right. for imperfection. 
or imperfect opposed. I don't see anything in this discussion that has ever actually that I've ever, ever actually been enthusiastic about. I think pot, as I've said it before, pot makes otherwise interesting people boring, and it's, it's not a, a necessarily a good thing. But it struck me as a matter of proportion that the laws against marijuana did more harm. Than the marijuana. Exactly. Well, the feds do it yeah, too no. because it's all cash. But, well, the, the world is full of things that people. Uh, I wish uh, I, I, people overeat. People don't get enough exercise. Cigarettes, alcohol, all sorts of bad things people do to themselves that we don't have laws against. Right. And then, having come that far, I took a libertarian view and just said, get get them out of it. Uh, but now, if we've come this far then tax and regulate actually does seem to make sense. To get some if we've come this far, we might as well. I oppose tax and regulate. Well, I said, I'm for, you know, the, the two ounces, let the hippie up the road have put his pot plants in the sunlight, not in the corn patch. Right. But, but now, you know, it's, it's like we've come this far, probably tax and regulate makes sense. But I don't think anyone has reason to be really happy about any of this. It's right. just sort of a reasonable fallback. Well, but some of our farmers are quite excited, and I was at a meeting with hemp. I mean, there is a whole proposal, quite exciting one, to turn the, the Windsor State Prison into a testing and drying facility for hemp. And there, you can be, you know, the hemp industry is just burgeoning uh, now, and we've only had it legal for two years. Take a walk downstairs, you can't believe how Yes, exactly. Dave's whole operation with CBD oil, but hemp is legal now in the federal farm bill. So yes, hemp is legal. So, uh, you know, it's a... Yeah, I was going to ask Dick a question uh, in relation to your caucus on climate issues. And uh, as someone in Winter County, I have taken note that the federal government released the climate report on the 27th of November. Okay, two days after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And in that report, there's a hundred authors or more. Over three are Vermonters who wrote in that report. Now, we have a state issue and a federal issue. I'm living within the U.S. Forest Service. I know that my ranger approved uh, a project on December 7th without reading the report and has no interest in actually sharing his reasons for not reading it with the public. And it's like, okay, I mean, where does our state legislators and the federal, how do we work with protecting our environment in Vermont? Are we watching each other? Well, the relationship between the states and the federal government when it's a federal issue with this federal jurisdiction is we are basically uh, petitioners. We can make a comment and we can ask uh, and, 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 and urge. I mean, we can make an argument. We don't have, uh, the, the state does not have authority over federal decisions. Correct, but you're watching? Oh, yeah. And, and enacting our own laws, hopefully. Uh, hopefully, there is the will to, in the course of this biennium, really uh, take both aspirational, I would divide it, Mason, between aspirational goals, I have a, a carbon pricing bill, and uh, even the most conservative e economists are supportive of, of, of some form of carbon pricing. So I, I'd say that our bills so far that have been introduced are aspirational in nature and then very practical. So the practical includes, you know, measures for uh, electric vehicles and incentives for electric vehicles, incentives for more weatherization, because we all know that transportation and housing are the two biggest ways Vermonters contribute to uh, to climate change. So we have very practical measures that have been introduced both in the House and the Senate, and uh, we'll be taking those up and uh, hopefully in our small footprint reduce our carbon footprint. Have, have you read the, uh, the federal report? No, I haven't. I've read the executive summary. And so just, to go, back to the, just to go back to that, we did stuff last year with the Volkswagen settlement, which the money we got from that because of the, um, you know, the Volkswagen emissions problem where they were defrauding, you know, fraudulent 
testing. So we put that money into, it was required to go into different things that dealt with emissions. So we put that into uh, electric charging stations, a certain amount. We put it into the state fleet to have more electric vehicles. We put it into conversion of some, um, some diesel buses to electric. Right. What else did we do with it? That's a lot of it, it we we went, and we're going to continue because there's more money this year. Yeah, so um, more money so this year. That's also going to yeah. be most of the funding for the electric, mm -hmm. the, for the EV piece. Well, one of my concerns is that for the state of Vermont, we have an asset. We what? We have an asset which oh. is related to almost the Amazon. <clears throat> and as individuals, we, we think about these courageous folks trying to save the lungs of the planet because it's an asset with CO2 emissions. We're sitting on an asset, and we better pay attention to what's forest. going on, because there's been orders given by the federal government to do certain things. <coughs> I mean, we see the federal government looking to now go into the Porcupine Reserve in Alaska to start drilling for more fossil fuels. This is a concern to us. What are we doing to be concerned about our assets? Uh, there's lots of work on carbon forest uh, <coughs> sequestration, as you know, and uh, that is continuing. And I think that the the first step, as we all know, is educating people enough to appreciate that asset and to understand its value. And so I think there's lots of there there's lots of work going on mm -hmm. uh, with that in the state house and uh, both private owners. One of the biggest cha challenges we face in the state on on carbon sequestration through our incredible forest. As you know, a vast percent of Vermont is forested, and I can't remember exactly what it is, but the big challenge we face is that, yes, the state owns some of that forest, yes, the feds own some of it, but a huge amount is owned by private, uh, both big companies like paper companies and private individuals. With private individuals, we are really facing a succession challenge, which as uh, because all our foresters, the major tracks are aging big time, and as they die or retire and are not, and and their land, thousands of acres are being passed on to, to their children or their grandchildren who don't necessarily have the same value, who may just want to sell it off. And so one of our biggest challenges actually that we face is the fragmentation of our forest. And uh, so, <laughs> Education is a big piece of how do we keep that forest together because its impact and its value is as a totality. It's also farming, though. Mm -hmm. Forestry is farming. It's a, yeah, it's a huge it's, percent. It's, a, it's not yeah. a, a annual thing. It's a you know it's longer it's out, but it is farming. I mean, Vermont was bald in 1900. We were out. Right? You know, it yes. was, but I'm just saying yeah. this. And you know, there's also a great thing that's just happening with regard to workers' comp. Allison, you might know this, but with regard to the logging industry and the yeah. in woods, of course, it's incredibly dangerous. There was just another fellow from Springfield who died this yeah. weekend. But the uh, workers' comp is going down like 40 percent because right. of an arrangement they've made for that, and probably going to affect other businesses whose workers' comp will also go down. Yeah. So that's some good news. Which is happening. terrific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, um, what, 13 to 14 percent of our, our land mass in Vermont now is owned by trust? Land trust? I don't know. I don't think that much. I, I, maybe. I don't know. And, and you know, Neil, some of that is just the way families put their land legally. I mean, it may, it may be... Well, Vermont it, has, uh, sorry to interrupt, but Vermont yeah. has created the land use yeah. program. Which is basically allowing them a tool to circumvent. You know, we're going to tax that idea or let us have access. We'll give you a better deal. I'm part of that now. I did for 30 years, but that puts it in a management plan, which right. makes which is it right. Right. You know, it's you know there, there is a certain amount of uh, you know. I think we have to pay attention to it. So I'm well, the, forced to manage yeah. it for me, so. Well, the great thing about that is it's keeping our uh, working lands community and those jobs viable right, and sustainable, right. which is terrific. Without that requirement of managing the land, you we'd be losing more loggers, more truckers, more but foresters. The tax, it, at the same yeah. time, it right. shifts that tax burden to somewhere else. Somewhere else. So. It's in the education fund, and I, you know, Vermont would not be what you see today without the current use program. So it is our largest conservation program, 
and one I'm really proud of because it, it challenges us to keep our working lands viable at the same time as it manages our forests. So it's, it's also kept Vermont looking like what people think of as Vermont, but it's also kept a working lands industry alive. Well, and one thing I want to just say, I got to go real quick, but child care, I have a yeah. daughter who's, uh, I'm trying to get to come to work for me, you know, she came back from off from Massachusetts, had a child, 10 months old, whatever, I'm trying to get her to come into my business and take over, but child care for her 10 month old is paramount, and, you know, we, I grew up, my generation, my kids, my neighbor down the street was fabulous, did a great job, I didn't have to work about abuse or anything like that, and I think, you know, we need to look at a way maybe with these schools that are underutilized to uh, and, and these kids that you know kid everybody has to have a sense of worth so if you take a you know in the old days when you went to school if you were a 10th grader or whatever you might be helping a fourth grader do math in a single room school room 100 years ago in Vermont but at the same time if you have the oversight with four people in the room with these toddlers and whatever inside of this building that it, and it might be like they're working downstairs here from 8 to 12. It's a four hour increment, it's not a full day. But I mean, I, that's where I, and I don't have an answer for her. I mean, I stay home from my job, which I could make a lot more money. You know, it's a good job. Doing a 10 month old. So, yeah. it's a huge I do enjoy it, I totally right. love it. But at the same time, right. you know. So we are putting more money into childcare. Yeah. And into, we're putting, I forget how much, but it's a huge. small fortune. Yeah. And, and trying to do something with regard to the education piece that's required for some providers because it's been something that people haven't needed but it's been required. In other words, there may be people who are perfectly capable, have all the safety training that the state requires, but they don't have, they're not working toward their degree in early education, which there have been some requirements for that, which some people don't need to get that. Their parents themselves they're, do all the safety, their home is safe. And if they don't want to get a degree in early education and they don't want to get the increased money that comes with that, um, forget it. Let them just do child care. But the child care bill is in Sandy's committee, I believe. Uh, there are half a dozen. Yeah, yeah. but you are going to be all, they're all the are. first movers on this. Uh, this yeah, you know. yeah, we are actually looking at that this, we're starting that, looking at that this week. Um, God, I don't even know where to start. There's, so the biggest issue right now is slots. We just we just don't we don't have enough places right. for children to go. Right. The, the, then once you, if we if we get the places, then then how do how do we pay for it? And how do we pay the staff enough that they won't leave after three months? You know, it's 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 a mess. Right. Um, and and the governor has proposed taking some money out of one pot and putting it into that pot to increase right. um, um, the num the the amount the number of people who could be subsidized. Um, it's it's a big question, but we're going to we're going to start chewing on it this week. Um, the we heard from the commissioner um, who handles this area, the with the child development D division. Uh, she feels very strongly that having some kind of um, child development specific training is important for at least the person who's in charge of the facility, maybe not all the workers. So, so one of, one of the things is so okay, fine, that's great. How do we how do we transition to that? What do we do to make sure that the folks who are doing it now don't get shut out? And so those are those are the kinds of questions we're going to be looking at. Dave, or, or Dave was on school board about or just <coughs> as a question: How much utilization in that building over there right now? How many rooms are open in that building with this downsizing and stuff? Actually, right now, none. Really? Because they've downsized to a middle school, so they've expanded their programs. A year ago, there were probably two rooms that could have served Well, that's what I'm saying. You have food services in the building. You have a nursing staff in the building. Oh. Um, you have a lot of assets in the building. I think you are spot on, and I think and that's it, where I'm if from. local yeah. delivery, I mean, it's easy it's a, to go to school, go back, go to work. And I agree. That it's a great way to repurpose. There's probably, if if the emphasis was set there, they could reconfigure how they use their rooms. Right. Yeah. I agree. New, New Hampshire did an interesting thing. They coupled, in some cases, such as in Claremont, um, adult data pro adult data programs with with a child daycare program next door, and then there'd be a certain amount of cross-relationship, yeah. which did 
probably the elderly more good than, but I think it worked well for both sides. Yes, nice I thing. think so. But it's just, I think yeah. it's easier to see the effect that it had on the elderly. Yeah. I think you find out what it had to do with the kids. 20 years later. Exactly. So, so adult day programs tend to have people who can't be left alone. Well, so, it's been across. I mean, I, I was sort of involved in some of that uh -huh. over the, uh, my, my ex-wife was a, a legislature there. Uh -huh. and she followed that very closely. There are, there's a cross-section of a lot of it, and um, I'm just saying I think it's worth but, it. But, but there, are, there, are, there, are, there are lots of people who would like to see us get, get older, get our, I'm going to call them our, our uh, uh, mature uh, population more involved in the It's, with, it's good for everybody. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I you, can't, you, can't, you can't retrofit these places necessarily, but I think it's an interesting thought to have it in mind Absolutely. going forward. Another point thing you want to consider about uh, trying to move into the schools is the schools are being pressured to do a lot more than they did when I was, Danny and I were in school. Yeah, sure. I mean, we, in, in this area, we have our uh, special ed coordinator that has spent years working on what they call a restorative classroom, but, but they don't have enough room for that. And what that is, they try to bring children that are costing the district 100000 a year or more, yeah. bring, bring them back. back and be able to afford the qualified people to instruct those kids, okay? Uh, so I know that's what happened over here is we had no place to put that. So with a combination of Royalton and Bethel doing what they did, they have found a room. And now that it's working, they need more that they don't have. Because it's working. Because it's working. It's so successful. It's How many students, Dave, have they been able to bring back? Three or four, the last that's I knew, exciting. but at a hundred grand a piece, yeah, that's, that's that pays for a couple yeah. people. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they can get those two people, now they can yeah. handle more. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this will be played out in the, in the legislature in a, in a number of committees. You've got the Health and Welfare Committee in the House and in the Senate. I serve on House Senate Health and Welfare. <laughs> and we've been taking a lot of testimony on this. Uh, the, the expense, the cash outlay, for child care is really prohibitive. It, it, it is one of the factors that makes it, when people say, you know, you can't make a living in Vermont, people can't make ends meet. That's one of the big expenses. Uh, but the other thing is, even if, you're, if, if you've got the, the money or you, you, you're, you're somehow going to find the money, um, just finding the, the, the spaces. Especially for infants. Yeah. And uh, so, so it's it's a problem. I can tell you, my own in my own family, my my wife is doing a lot of child care right now. Yeah. Um, but uh, the action ultimately will be in the appropriations committees, and uh, that is hard because people uh, don't want to be taxed anymore, and you you can't spend money you don't have. It's hard to spend money you don't have, especially when you have to tax people in order to get it in the first place. That's why but you don't have The it. government's budget that you were talking about at the very beginning does not include, the budget does not include things that you're not taxing, that you might be able to tax. For instance, you let a corporation come to town, you give it a tax abatement. That abatement doesn't turn up in the state's budget. The state doesn't 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 write down the amount of money that it's giving away, not in checks, but in oh, we need more nurses. Not so so we're gonna give nurses free tuition. We want our woodlands to be managed properly, so we will tax them at a lower rate if they're managed properly. And we get the beautiful woodlands. Sometimes we get land trusts in addition, but we get the beautiful woodlands, and there's a certain amount of property tax that's not being collected. That number doesn't turn up in the budget. Well, it does turn up, though, in the legislative considerations of the budget. It's called, they're called tax expenditures. But year on year, a, uh, year on year, it's not in the budget. Is the Amazon tax? Yes. yes. So we are getting a 6% yes. from all yes. of that yes. stuff coming in. No, you're not. If, if you're reporting. <laughs> what do you mean yes or no? No, they have time to lose. No, Amazon is now collecting it. Amazon is collecting the tax now in Vermont. We had a, I forget exactly what we did, but two years ago, to, we were going to impose something on companies like Amazon, and Amazon, rather than having that imposed on them, agreed to pay the tax to Vermont, cool. and they do now. This happened about, I think about, was it about two years ago? And they don't pass it on to their customers, though. 
Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. I think any, I'm not, I'm, and I don't mean to beat up Amazon, I think any internet company that is challenging our brick and mortars needs to be yes. put, and it's the same with the A or B. If I want to put a place in my house for taking people in for the weekend or whatever, you know, I'm competing with Harrington or the Greenhurst End or whatever. Yeah. You got to compete on fair. So levels. Airbnb now, just Airbnb as a company, not not the yes, other. Yes, but they are not, just, not the other home just home 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 yet. Doing the same but they they are collecting the tax right. and sending it to the state of Vermont. Thank right. God. Right. You're right. But there are other things with regard to you know, the, the, air, the Airbnb forward. that's next door to an inn that has to have their water tested, fire inspector, and the big Victorian right. well, store. There is, there is a, there is we're a loophole that is coming in, in our bill. <coughs> we're thing we're coming up. constantly noodling it. There is a loophole in the um, in the Amazon tax. Um, it, it if, if I buy something from Amazon, the six percent gets put on on, and I pay it, and Amazon turns it over to the state. But if Amazon connects me to some third party vendor, that that piece, as I understand it, is still is still open. Well, that's what I'm saying. And, and, there, there, and, 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 and our and our, our our tax yeah. committee is working ways this, means it's this, working this year on trying to figure out millions how we how we yeah it's yeah it's it's a chunk, and apparently it's a growing. I understand that it's a growing piece of Amazon's business, so so it's it's something that we're. we're but the plus is we broke, you know, we're we're broken the back on that, and, and all internet sales are now taxed, and we just need to fix some of those loopholes. But thank uh, LLB for us. Um, not to change the subject, but Dick McCormick, my question is for you on Act 250. You're on that board. What is going with, on with Act 250? Right? Yes, which is up for review. Act 250, Act 50. It's 50 that, years old. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, 50 year review. Yeah. Is anything active with that right now? <laughs> yeah, there's there's legislation pending um, before the, uh, I guess in both houses, both the natural resources and energy committees are considering. And I'm not on either of those committees, so I, I was very active over that over the summer and autumn. I have more or less. Um, well, I thought I heard that you were in the Act 50 committee. I was. You were. He was Sorry, on the commission. I, on that commission. Oh, commission. So, yeah. so we did our work over the spring, summer, yes. and fall. Uh, at, that, at this point now, that has gone to the, the standing legislative committees in both houses. Okay. So Any we'll ideas agree. on what big changes are going to be made in there? Well, I think one of the one of the the, the changes is is to first of all, uh, we have different problems now than we had 50 years ago. 50 years ago, I mean, now where people are talking about how do you attract people to Vermont, how do you encourage people to stay in Vermont, 50 years ago the state felt it was being invaded. There was this influx of people, which was not seen necessarily as a bad thing, but it certainly created problems. Um, because we, we had a long history of being re relatively unregulated. And so suddenly you're getting you know, sewage flowing on, on the surface down hills in, in southern Vermont and bad construction practices and so on. Um, so Act 250 was a way of getting a grip on the invasion of new people. Over the years, one of the problems has been uh, um, you know, the shopping malls, the big box stores. So on. Well, the big box stores tend to be empty these days. Uh, the shopping malls are empty, um, and we're and now we're we're worried about about uh, um, not having enough people to pay the taxes. So the focus, at, if there's legislation suggesting that we focus on on encouraging development downtown, in part by entrusting local communities. Taking some of the authority that has been enjoyed by the by Act 250 and shifting it to that, that if those Act 250 criteria are dealt with at a town level for downtown, that that will be at least a rebuttable presumption that the Act 250 criteria have been met. Um, but they have to uh, they have to be designated an enhanced downtown. They they have to agree yes, to certain yes. uh, to yeah. And then once they have the enhanced downtown, right, they would get yeah. a wave on Act 250. Any development that was downtown would not so would have be to any go back to rules to draw people and businesses manufacturing into our state, or no? Well, Act 250 has always um, been, it always, well, first of all, let me finish the point I was making, is, is that besides having some deference to town authorities for downtown development, that then there will be extra emphasis on preserving the, the surrounding 
green countryside. And uh, that's sort of a, a balance, it's a trade-off. Uh, the, um, as far as, uh, Act 250 has always been pro-development. I'm not sure everybody has, has understood that. It's one of the, in the 60s, with the invasion happening, uh, there were people, um, it's interesting, because there were people. Invasion, boy. Of people. Uh, <laughs> was the <laughs> Uh, that that uh, in, in this area, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I would call it an invasion. I came in the sixties. <laughs> there was a, 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 a there were people who, whose whose conservatism was basically Vermont is fine the way it is, leave it alone. And then there were people who said, uh, no, 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 bring the development on. We want the jobs, we want the capital coming in, we want the revenue. And so and that was the 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 battle. Dean Davis and Art Gibb and all those Vermont Republicans, to give credit where it's due, came up with this brilliant, com and not a compromise as a meeting in the middle, a compromise as in recognizing both sides. They said, bring it on, bring in the development, but when you do it, you gotta do it right. Okay, so did I, I don't think Act 250 was ever intended to encourage development, although other things do encourage development. But it was that if you're gonna have development, you gotta do it right. That was really the, the, the general thrust of it. And I think that remains, that, that uh, remains to this day. So um, I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. Do some ideas with them. Okay. I got a couple things I'm gonna say, which is already, we're already too late, so I don't need to expect a response. Just listen, please. Electri uh, in my trade as electrician, yeah. uh, in re reference to the small rental issues, um, Airbnb we, and the like, and the like is and the like, yeah. whatever, yeah. or just plain rental. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a inspection system in this state, fire marshals and electrical inspectors, that a few of them are love the power. Oh, love the power in oh. their office. Oh. In this town, I know for sure that there's been at least two rentals that said, to hell with it, we'll leave them empty. We're not going to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to make you happy. We will do all the safety stuff, but because you want, in my opinion, some things that have nothing to do with safety done that are very expensive, we're going to, I mean, one guy even put a red tag on the door, but take, oh, cease and desist, no more work until you do what I tell you. Another house. Was this fire safety or? It was a, actually this particular one was a, a fire marshal. The, uh, the one that I'm currently working on is uh, again, a fire fire marshal, electrical, whatever. Other states have accepted uh, uh, the new technology of smoke detectors and carbon dioxide smoke detectors and whatever. This state is still living with, okay, you've got this beautiful house with the moldings and this metal ceiling. Whatever. I'm going to make you rip that all apart so that we can put in um, electrically connected devices. And people are saying, no, you're not. Sorry, this is not going to be for rent. So think about that closely. The other thing I want to talk about is when you're talking about the governor's term, I, I disagree with the fact that you want to keep it as it is. And I disagree with you. you only have four months. I'm sorry. You have all year to think about stuff and be prepared when you get there for your four months. Whether I'm right or wrong, I, I, I don't care. Believe me, we work all year but round. I, I, but, but yeah, if I you, if I listen to, I happen to be in the truck driving, and I listened to a, a, a thing on VPR about this. And it was, I can't remember how far I drove, but it was a long ways, and they were on the whole time. And there was pros and cons. Now, I believe that a four-year term is fine. But the, the people who said no, well, that person will have more time to get more money. Well, if that's your problem, then change your campaign, campaign finance rules. I think there's a huge disparity on people who are able to raise millions, and then some people who have a hard time getting a few thousand. Uh -huh. And maybe this person has <clears throat> got some new ideas, and it'd be great to be there, but he doesn't have the longevity or been there for 50 years and have the people that will back and they have millions. So, okay, you're running for Senate. Everybody that runs for Senate, applies to the state, gets $5,000.
that's probably a weird number, but yeah, that's come up. You can get five thousand dollars. He gets five thousand dollars. You mean from the state, from the taxpayers? That's all you can spend. That's all you can spend. Oh, that's all you can spend. Oh. Period. You can't spend a million dollars, and he spends five thousand. But can other people spend? No. That's you, how you regulate. That's, that's the free problem. Speech. Is we have all kinds of regulations in this state. No, not just, I mean, what happens is other groups who don't even know who they are then send out something supportive or against, or they send out a big blast. I mean, somebody spent $3,000 on the Washington County Senate race right at the end. Some people who were supporting the environment, they got together and they, they, so did, did, they it, didn't even ask the person. They just spent it. All right, but when that happens, do, are they going to feel obligated to when they have when they're asking for something to give them maybe a little more consideration? Who knows? But you know that's the I mean, way. Come on, we're human beings. Even know we, about it. It's it's up here. It's in your mind. Well, so we, I mean, that may well be, but I mean, the person whose candidacy anyway, they spend it on. Right or wrong? No. I, I had to. Get, we, I wanted. I wanted to give my that, opinion. We actually had um, campaign spending limits, and they were found unconstitutional as a denial of free speech. I don't agree with that. I like your idea, but it didn't work. Yeah, I like your idea as well. Uh, but it's a more yeah, level so, so something to be discussed, yeah. And there was a the Supreme Court case called Buckley versus Roy, in which the Supreme Court said money so is speech. So you have a right to speak. You also have a right to give me money so that I will say you like what I'm yeah, saying. So you give me money and help me say that's speech. That's you speaking according to the book Buck Buckley versus Wilson. And it really ties our hands. That was we had a a, um, a campaign finance law that um, had been ruled unconstitutional. And I voted to pass another law that said essentially the same thing for the purpose of creating a test case. In other words, we knew it would end up back in court. And it was inviting the court to change its mind. They didn't. <laughs> we got we got shot down as unconstitutional. And, and if the court says it's unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional. Well, so they, so they say. But they're the, they're, they're the ones who get to say. Right. I, mean, that's, I, I understand that's that, but, but that doesn't make it right. The other, uh, the other thing that I have a concern about is, is when you go to two-year terms of any of any kind, uh, those people that are running are spending too much time in running. Okay. Now, especially when you're talking about a governor who has a year-round job, if he really wants to be governor again, he's already looking at the next campaign. Where maybe if he was running for four years, he maybe he'd give us two years of un. Divided attention, especially if he didn't have to raise the more money than has him. Put the lie to that. He's running all the time. <laughs> yeah, um, I can. Well, we can argue all day long, but I, I just want. I'm saying things I'd like you guys to think yes, about. No, okay. I, I hate having to run every two years. It means every other year I don't get to take a long hike. You know, to be out for service. But I support a two-year term for the Senate, and the reason is virtually any controversial legislation. People who disagree with my position don't just disagree with my position. Invariably, they accuse me of, quote, not listening to the people. And I want the opportunity to put that accusation to the test. Okay? You know, you're not listening to the people. We'll remember in November, and then November comes, and those of us who took this controversial position all get reelected. Then we, 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 we may still be wrong, but it's not that we didn't listen to the people. <laughs> okay, and uh, so I, I like the I, and, and if at some point a lot, enough legislators don't listen to the people, the people ought to have the opportunity to, to fire them. Oh, I agree. But the way it usually works is the opposite. It's, it's a vindication, and I, I want that opportunity. One more thing that wasn't brought up at all, and I'm sure you somewhere in some committee you're talking about it, yeah. is as I get older, it's becoming more apparent to me that I'm not going to be able to fail, afford health care or drugs. Right now, between my wife and I, if we didn't have the health care that she has, it'd be over $3,000 a month just for medications. She's diabetic and I have heart problems. $3,000 a month. And we are, she's 61, I'm 64. It's not going to get better. Neither one of us are going to get better. And when I, when I go on to Social Security, my social security won't pay for my drugs. So you will, you, your social security won't, but if you get a supplemental plan, like one of the 
don't have stuff. Prescriptions aren't cheap. They're not cheap. They look like a prescription drug plan to a, com a company what you have. I've already looked in that. Yeah. It would be half my Social Security check just for health care. For the whole overall health care. Yeah, that's just health care and prescription. Just half my patient. And, and that, that other $650 a month to pay taxes. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, eating. Electricity, day by ain't gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna go to Minnesota, or to New Hampshire, where my kids have been forced to go already. It's cheaper there. Healthcare is cheaper there than. Oh yeah. yeah. Dave, I go to Canada. Yeah. 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 Well, that. Yeah. That's what I get it. I get it for a third less than I would here in the states. And it's the same goddamn same, same drug. My wife's drug <laughs> in uh, 20 years ago was $12 a vial. Yeah. It's now $370. I know. This is out of control. $375 for that little one month vial. Right. And she has that two per month. You know, that is one place where there's some hope that Congress may have. Because, because I believe that the President actually cares about that issue. Um, and I, I saw that Trump just put it in there. So there was just a scandal. So uh, a drug that was being given away by a manufacturer was bought by another company, and they put a price of hundred thousand dollars a year on it. It had been given away free. Yeah, it's yeah, sort of I, arbitrary. I, I get that. Uh, listen, before we leave, I just I want to make clear, I've never said I was a constitutional scholar. <laughs> okay? I, I never claimed. No, the trouble with it with that is when people make claims in your behalf, then when people find out it's not true, they think you're the one who's full of both. We will be back here again on March 25, you one month from the same time, same place. Hope to see you all then. At 7.30. 7.30 in the morning. Yeah, thank you. I never said that. I never said we shouldn't have that. What would you leave? What would you leave? I said we shouldn't do that. You have some homework to do, by the way. It's only values historically. The Herald, it's not what you think the standard is. It's not what has weekly summation of the activities that are going on in Montpelier. Which is a really quick you said you read it fast and you know what's going on in Montpellier. They could be as I'm glad someone's reading it because it takes forever to put together. They could be a little more descriptive though. Some of them are quick. Uh, Bill H. Times of 47 is sponsored by a Joe Fred and Sam. Yeah. Well, at least I got I get the head in there. It always, it always says the, the description of the bill. And it turns out many of them are, are nuanced enough that it takes several paragraphs to describe what they actually do. So Maybe a link right behind it. Yeah. Well, the link is, is at the end of the whole thing. Oh, it says, okay. go, I, go here, type in I, this I, bill. I, I, I actually done. have to admit that I get about three quarters through and say, yeah, it's tiring. It really is. I thought the last one was excellent. Very brief and concise. And, excellent. Uh, didn't drag on yeah. at all. I've been worried. I just get the paper here on Thursday. Thursday. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. Um, <laughs> Tell me about it. Is that, is that post office? <laughs> it's a bizarre combination of the papers not getting to the post office as early as they used to, and then the post office holding on to them for an entire day before they do anything with it. But only in White River Junction, because we deliver directly to the Randolph post office Thursday morning, and they get it out immediately. So it's. We still don't and they haven't returned our calls for the last week at the White River Post Office, so it's a, we're working on it, but it's a big hassle. Call your, <laughs> call your senator, your U.S. senator. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good luck. I can't even get to Hale's. I know. What's your, what's your call? <laughs>